Earlier this week, Venezuela's right-wing opposition leader, Enrique Capriles, called for the unseating of the Nicolas Maduro government before the end of that government's constitutional period of office, which runs through to 2019. The backdrop for these remarks are what many believe is an economic war being undertaken in Venezuela to destabilise the Nicolas Maduro government. To discuss this further, we are joined today by Dr. Francisco Dominguez. Dr. Dominguez is head of Latin American Studies Unit at Middlesex University in London. He's the author of a book which looks at the right-wing strategies against the popular governments of Latin America, and he himself is a political refugee from the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet in Chile that came to power via a coup in 1973. Welcome, Dr. Francisco Dominguez. Many have drawn parallels with the situation in Venezuela today and the build-up to the coup d'etat in Chile in 1973. Do you see any parallels with the two situations? Good afternoon. Oh, there are plenty of them. Uh, the first is that the main source of the destabilization is the United States. Uh, the script is very similar. The idea is basically to make the economy scream, to use Nixon's famous phrase or infamous phrase. And the idea is to use any resource that the United States has in the world economy, particularly regarding raw materials, in the case of Chile, it was copper, in order to make sure that the revenues accruing to the state were so small and then also uh, finance the internal opposition so that they, by their control of their distribution system, commerce, trade, and so on internally, they could engage in hoarding uh, as much as possible so as to make the population suffer, to punish them. And the basic idea behind it was to make the situation so difficult so that people ended up regretting having elected a government of the left, both in the case of Chile Allende and now, obviously, in the case of the Chavista government since 1998. Can you give some more detail on how the economic war in Chile was organized in the build-up to the coup in 1973? Well, they went, first of all, for uh, stopping the public transport system, which was run by private companies, particularly the distribution system. Chile is a very long country. You possibly have seen the map. And it's quite easy, therefore, to um, stop, you know, the internal distribution of things by having control over this. The people who actually went on strike by not moving their trucks along the country or around the country were given a huge amount of money, so they didn't lose too much. The second thing they did was that they hoarded absolutely vital daily consumption items, such as flour, edible oil, um, you know, uh, coffee, um, anything that, milk, anything that they could make the population suffer with. And the basic idea was to provoke deliberately queues outside shops. And then once these um, queues were actually created, sometimes people waited for hours. And um, then they would use these queues and this content of the population to create, to cause riots and uh, street disturbances. And um, in the case of Chile, it was extremely effective. Um, because we didn't have state that supported us, we just had the government. In the case of Venezuela, although it's effective, it's not as effective as, as it was in Chile, precisely because the situation is different. And how is economic warfare being organised in Venezuela today, in your opinion? Um, well, they tried this already in 2007. And what they have done is to use their control, the private control that they have over distribution networks in supermarkets and all sorts of other items, um, then they hoard the stuff. Literally, they hoard very targeted items. They don't hoard everything. They just hoard very targeted items. And these are items which are of mass consumption by the population in order to make sure that the Chavista part of the population, especially in the barrios, actually suffer the consequences of it. They have to um, they have to queue for hours on end in order to show this content. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is to engage in contraband, massive contraband. According to one of the ministers, about 30% of the agricultural produce that is either in Venezuela because it's imported, because it's produced internally, domestically in the country, actually ends up in Colombia. And they speculate on using the differential in the exchange rate, exchange rate to do this to the bordering states. And, you know, these, they are operating in case contraband with mafias. There are millions and millions of liters of gasoline have been uh, contrabanded in this way. 
So that's the second thing, and it's extremely damaging. And the third one um, is the fact that they speculate on the currency. We know that there are different different exchange rates for the dollar in Venezuela. One is 630, the other one is about 11, and the third one is about 63 uh, bolivares per dollar. Uh, so people obtain dollars at the official rate, that is to say very low, then they claim that they're going to use them for all sort of other entrepreneurial uh, motives and reasons, and they end up actually not buying the stuff and speculating with the hard currency and uh, selling them in the black market. And there is a huge amount of investigation. So they have these three very powerful weapons by which they can complicate. And now recently in the last period, as we all know, uh, the United States in cahoots with Saudi Arabia and some of the client states in the Middle East, they've been producing, producing a glut of oil in the world market in order to bring down the price of oil, thereby another, making another twist, you know, turn another twist on the Venezuelan economy, which makes is making things much more complicated. So there you have, as it were, um, a whole very clearly well orchestrated, well organized, well planned uh, economic war, which is producing severe complications uh, to the Venezuelan economy and to the Venezuelan people. In addition to economic warfare, how else did the opposition in Chile try to organize destabilization against the Allende government? And again, what similarities do you see with the situation in Venezuela today? Well, the destabilization program in Chile began before Allende actually assume office. Between uh, September 1970, when Agenda was actually elected, and November 1970, when actually Agenda actually assumed office, there were about three attempts at coup d'etat, including one assassination of the uh, commander-in-chief of the armed forces um, through operatives financed and armed by the CIA. The declassified, declassified documentation proved this totally conclusively. And they ended up assassinating him. And there was a couple of attempts at the coup d'etat only in those two months. And ever since 1971, 72, 73, and the amount of terrorism, there, is, there was an organization which is which there is a very similar parallel in Venezuela. It was called Patria Libertad, uh, Homeland and Freedom, which was a fascist organization, extreme right wing, which was funded by the extreme right wing, the very powerful people. And they went around the place planting bombs, attacking her posters of the left, organizing street disturbances, street riots, uh, burning things, and so on. I mean, pretty much what they have been able to do in Venezuela through Voluntad Popular, the popular group, which is led by Leopoldo Lopez, one, one of the leaders, Leopoldo Lopez. And there are some parallels. And the level of destruction that they did in Chile was absolutely gigantic. And in Venezuela, it was quite told me as well. Nevertheless, the difference is that the government in Venezuela has been able to respond better because it's got, um, you know, the state is much more um, progressive than uh, the state was in Chile, different from the government. And the parallels is totally clear. And the right wing was totally behind it. On the one hand, was contributed massively, deliberately, behind the scenes, sometimes openly, to cause all the complications, and then using complications created to criticize the government and so, so in this content among the population for to capitalize politically out of it. In the case of Chile, the purpose was to create conditions for a coup d'etat, which we know they succeeded. In Venezuela, I wouldn't be surprised if they had exactly the same intentions. You've made some important distinctions between the situation in Venezuela today and that in Chile in the run-up to the coup. Why are you more hopeful about the situation in Venezuela today? In Chile, we had little committees of the population in various places. Chile was quite well organized in that sense. By the way, small committees without really legal power. So we were able to go to some traders that we knew were hoarding stuff. And then you will discover 50 kilos of sugar or 100 kilos of sugar. We'll open up the shop, we'll force the owner to sell the stuff at um, fixed prices, uh, you know, the uh, the prices that were legal, and then they disappeared in a couple of minutes because the person came and bought them. In the case of Venezuela, because it's the state, that is to say, the armed forces, an element we didn't have with, with on our side, um, which is actually fighting against contraband, which is fighting against hoarding. And you can see the level of seizures which the armed forces are managing to uh, 
uh, get. Uh, so TJ Kanti, just one example. Uh, I read the other day uh, that one of the uh, holdings, which was medical equipment, which is something absolutely disgusting to hold medical equipment, which might mean that people die because they're ill. In one of these holdings, 22 million syringes were discovered. That's given an idea. We never, ever in Chile were able to actually get that level of seizure because we didn't have the forces of the state, the whole state apparatus behind us. In Venezuela, they do, and I think that is what makes it very, very different in, in that sense.